Welcome back to Historical Geology. I'm, I'm going to continue here with Chapter 9 on the Proterozoic. And we left off talking about Proterozoic supercontinents, and the one we mentioned was Rodinia. Remember, the, the key thing with Rodinia is we have these Grenville orogenies, right? And the Grenville orogenies are those high-grade, high-pressure granulite facies, metamorphic rocks that just about every continent has. So think of these as like bumpers on a car. So when, when there's an accident, the, the edges are the ones that are getting crumpled, and you can reassemble the continents based on uh, the characteristics. In this case, we're looking for the granulite facies metamorphism. Another thing that we should mention here is, and significant here to California and Western United States, is what happened to Rodinia. And Rodinia rifted, it broke apart. Today, a modern example of a rift is the East African rift, where Somalia and Ethiopia are breaking away or rifting away from mainland Africa. And what we find there, we find a rift valley and we find uh, volcanic rocks, big volcanoes like Mount Kenya and Mount Kilimanjaro. So again, examples of a, of a rift. So here we're going to see uh, a rift occurring between Laurentia and East Antarctica and South Africa here. What occurred here is that once we rift uh, Laurentia from East Antarctica, we're going to develop the Paleo-Pacific Ocean, so the beginning of the Pacific Ocean. So here we don't have a Pacific Ocean yet. This is going to be the birth of the Pacific Ocean. And this rift began around 750 million years ago. Other thing to note here is, at this time, the model I want you to think about, Laurentia, or at least the Western United States, is in the middle of this supercontinent of Rodinia. And so I call this the Kansas model because it's like Kansas in the middle of North America. In this case, California, or the bit of California that existed at this time, mainly Death Valley region, was in the middle of this large Rodinian supercontinent. So we're going to see this rifting begin around 750 million years ago. And our little model that we look at here is we have the continent, and then we start developing these, these grobbins, or normal faulting, resulting in um, rifting. We see volcanics, like uh, in the East African Rift, we have Kilimanjaro and Mount Kenya. Uh, and so these are, and also we'll collect a lot of rift sediment, a lot of basins, maybe some shallow sea will move in here, shallow water carbonates, we'll see limestones and, and quartz sandstones developing on a passive trailing continent to margin. And in the end, uh, one thing that I ask in my study guide is there's only one way to develop a trailing continental passive margin. The only way to do that is to rift a continent. Uh, the, the example or the modern example of that is the uh, Atlantic Ocean Basin. So we know that the east coast of the United States is a trailing continental margin and it's a passive margin. And the way it developed was when we rifted Pangaea. So remember Pangaea began to rift about 180 million years ago. Um, and that was the birth of the Atlantic Ocean. So anyways, here we're looking at the Paleo-Pacific, the rifting of Rodinia and developing a passive margin on the western North America or western Laurentia. And so today, the western United States is a very active margin. So all this has changed, mostly in the Phanerozoic time. We do have here in California and in Nevada, we have a group of rocks called the Pahrump Group. And the Pahrump Group are a series of of sedimentary rocks. They, they include the Crystal Springs Formation. There's one called the Horse Thief Springs Formation. Then we have the Beck Springs Formation. And finally, there's a Kingston Peak Formation, the last of which documents uh, this snowball earth occurrence here in, in Death Valley. But this power up group, these, these units are these rift margin sediments. So there, so here's a zone of future rifting. Note that here in Death Valley, California region, we're seeing the Parump group, the Crystal Springs, Horse Thief Springs, Beck Springs, and the Kingston Peak Formation. But over in, in the Grand Canyon region, we're seeing that Uncar group, which are really coeval. They're, they just represent a different type of facies. This is more toward the land, maybe shallow water, passive margin sediments. Here, the Parump group is more this basal, basin sediments that, that are developing this, this rifting margin. Note that here, we're, um, we're really at in the Mesoproterozoic, uh, just before we get to the Neoproterozoic, and we'll start developing this, this Parump group here. Gondwana, which really assembled between about 800 to 650 million years ago, so in Neoproterozoic time, and this Gondwanan assemblage, the, the type of, 
orogenies or, or metamorphic events and mountain building events that occurred, we call these the Pan-African orogenies. Because we, and they, they range in ages from anywhere from around uh, 800 to about 540 million years. And one thing we don't see in the Northern Hemisphere, in, in Laurentia or Baltica or Siberia, we don't see orogenies or, or mountain building events happening in these Northern Hemisphere continents. So again, we're seeing Gondwana forming, and, and again, it's, it started around 800 to 650 million years ago, and it really didn't break up until it formed Pangaea and then broke up about 180 million years ago. So there's a long geologic history for these southern hemisphere continents being together and Gondwana being this supercontinent. So now I want to look at this snowball earth hypothesis. And during the Proterozoic, there were several glaciations, one in the Paleoproterozoic, but the ones that are associated with the snowball earth are the ones that occurred in the Neoproterozoic. And there were at least two pulses of this glaciation. You know, the evidence we see for this is because during this time, Rodinia, the supercontinent Rodinia, was formed, and much of it was near the equator. So we have this equatorial land masses. And what, that ha what happens there is that we see increased weathering because it's more tropical. And one thing that weathering does, it takes carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. It removes carbon dioxide uh, to form either carbonic acid, and the carbonic acid through hydrolysis is breaking down. Uh, the igneous rocks and the different minerals in the rocks. And these end up uh, producing bicarbonate ions. The bicarbonate ions wash out to the ocean. But again, uh, increased weathering removes carbon dioxide, which lowers the temperature. Also, the ice was down to about 30 degrees latitude. In some cases, uh, based on what we see here in Death Valley during this Neoproterozoic time, Laurentia was at the equator. So probably closer to the equator here. The ice itself expanding over continents and sea ice expanding over oceans has a very high albedo. So the albedo is Earth's reflectivity of solar radiation. So white materials like glaciers can reflect solar radiation more than darker oceans. In fact, uh, sea ice is about, has about 80% more reflectivity or albedo than, than the ocean. Uh, so the idea is if we did have frozen seas, then that perpetuates this high albedo, will perpetuate that cold um, temperature because of the lack of solar radiation. And then we have these tillites. So remember, tillite is a glacial deposit. Uh, the word usually is till, and till is anything that's picked up, transported, and dropped off by the glacier. So uh, they could be glacial moraines, or in this case, we mainly see these drop stones or glacial erratics that were carried by the glacier, maybe even rafted as sea ice or icebergs. And then when the iceberg or sea ice melted, those rocks embedded in the ice fell down onto the sea floor and made these drop stones. And then what we find on, at all these regions in the world, we find that there are a sequence of cap carbonates. After this removal of CO2, this, this frigid temperature, there must have been a swing. So something changed the temperature, and it looks like maybe a renewed volcanic activity around 635 million years ago started melting these glaciers and started warming up the planet. And one thing that we need about carbonates, we need warm water to precipitate lots of carbonates. But we had lots of, from the weathering, we had lots of bicarbonate and calcium ions in the seawater. So just the warmer temperatures would allow that precipitation of these limestones or dolomites. So here are some pictures of some drop stones. So these would be, these are marine mudstones and shales. And usually out in deeper waters, we have this quiet, fine mud-sized sediment forming. How can you have these big boulders suddenly in otherwise quiet waters? Well, the idea there must have been glaciers or sea ice, icebergs floating out in the ocean. And then when they melted, those embedded rocks dropped down into the sediment and made these drop stones. And then what we find at the end of these glaciations, there's these cap carbonates, so limestones that cap these carbonates. So these are um, drop stones and cap carbonates in Namibia, in Africa here. And we also have them here in California. This is Death Valley. This is the Panamint Range of Death Valley. And we have the Kingston Peak Formation here, which is a series of, of tillites. And you can see the drop stones in here, these bigger 
um, uh, glacial till that's in here uh, in this finer mud material. And then we see this cap dolo stone called the Noonday Dolomite, which is a carbonate sitting on top of this Kingston Peak Formation here in the Death Valley region. Another word we use for a tillite is this diamictite. So diamictite is often uh, associated with glacial deposits. Now, if we look at the Snowball Earth hypothesis, it's going to be a period of the Neoproterozoic era called the Cryogenian period. The, there were two glaciations during this Cryogenian period. There was an older Sturtian glaciation, which was from about 717 million years to 662 million years, and then a younger Mary Noen glaciation from 650 to 635. And one thing to have these glaciations advance to equatorial regions or to low latitudes, you need the ice to survive summers. And so during this Neoproterozoic time, the sun was about 6% dimmer than it is today. Then the second thing is the supercontinent Rodinia was at the equator. So again, we experienced more chemical weathering and removed more of that carbon dioxide, which lowered the global temperatures, lowered the greenhouse effect. Expanding gla glaciers grind up the rock. They, they create more surface area for more chemical weathering. Expanding glaciers increased Earth's albedo. So we talked about that already. What we do find in these cap carbonates is that we find these large aragonite crystals. Remember, aragonite is a polymorph with calcite of calcium carbonate. So it's also composed of calcium carbonate. And then there's also stromatolites associated with these. Uh, but to form these aragonite crystals, we need high concentrations of bicarbonate ion and calcium. So remember, these are occurring from the erosion, the chemical weathering of continental rock. So again, the climate also shifted from being an ice house to a warmer climate because to deposit these cap carbonates, you need warm waters. Uh, one thing that happens with, with carbonic acid, uh, because carbonic acid will dissolve these, is colder water will hold more gas. And the fact that there's more gas, you're going to produce more carbonic acid whereas warmer water does not hold as much gas. And that warmer water will lead to the precipitation of calcium carbonate. Other things we see is a sharp drop in the, in the carbon-13 isotopes. So we compare carbon-13 to carbon-12, and we've talked about this already, where carbon-12 is an isotope that's uh, isotope of carbon that's preferred during the photosynthetic process because it's a lighter isotope. So one thing that's happening during these warmer periods is we seem to be releasing more of that stored carbon-12. And so it's going to dilute the carbon-13 that's around, and it's going to drop that number. So warmer climate activates bacterial decomposition and releases more carbon-12 to the atmosphere. So in other words, what's happening at, over time, carbon-12 is being sequestered, it's being buried. Usually bacteria will break that apart by decomposing it and releasing that carbon-12 back to the atmosphere. But if there's low oxygen concentrations, it's colder climates, bacterial activity and decomposition slows down and you end up storing more of that carbon-12. But then during warmer periods, uh, we'll see that release of carbon-12, which is going to cause a drop in the carbon-13 isotope. So we'll look at a graph of that in a moment. Also, methane is a greenhouse gas. It's about 30 times stronger greenhouse gas than, than carbon dioxide. However, methane doesn't have a very long residence time in the atmosphere, but over short intervals of time, it's a very potent uh, greenhouse gas. Again, 30 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Also, during this time, we see renewed activity in the banded iron formations, you'll see that most banded iron formations formed in the, in the Proterozoic about 1.6 billion years ago to about maybe uh, 2 billion years ago. Most of them were forming during that time. But then we see them again. So about a billion years after that here, we're seeing them around 600 million years ago. Uh, it could be because there was more activity at a mid-oceanic ridge. The black smokers producing more of this reduced iron into the into the ocean. And then these hydrothermal vents also produce more silica, so that would mix with uh, the iron to produce those banded iron formations on the seafloor. 